My next guest is a retired Army Ranger and co-author of The 20-Year War, Tom Amenta, and he joins us now. Tom, thanks so much for joining me and for your service and uh, for your continued voice. So, Tom, I have to ask you, just to start, what is your reaction to the president's press address that he had just a little earlier? Um, anyone who can call this an extraordinary success while already having an administration that admits that we left Americans behind that, quote, wanted to leave, and hopefully we get to that a little later, I, who's a speechwriter and how did that even get into the draft? Because that's abhorrent. That is absolutely not in keeping with anything we do here in the United States that is antithetical to the American way. He thinks it's an extraordinary success that we left Americans behind. Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, like, I, 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 And I'm trying I'm to understand too, Tom, I'm trying to understand too, when, when they, they keep going back to this phrase, like people who choose to remain behind. Mm -hmm. I don't know anyone that's chosen to remain behind, but I do know people who weren't able to get their Taliban checkpoints because Taliban was apparently turning away some Americans and Afghan allies. Oh, I, so let me give you an example of that actually. And this is something that I dealt with um, in, in the real world. So there was a gentleman who has an American passport and the only family that he had was his 16 year old little brother but his little brother didn't have papers to go to the United States. So until uh, I was able to talk to some people and some friends of his were able to talk to people and connect them and realize that his little brother could in fact come with him to the United States as immediate family, he was prepared to stay in Afghanistan to take care of his little brother. So when the administration is trying to use this people who wanna leave as a get out of jail free card, what they're talking about is people that are making the choice of do I bring my little brother and I'm the oldest of four, okay? This one hits me really personally. Um, or, you know, or do I, you know, do I stay my elderly parents, right? Do I do, can they come with me or am I going to stay to try and take care of them and accept that risk? And listen, this is not the American culture. And I understand that, but some of these men and, you know, we're trying to make the decision of, they have multiple wives with a lot of kids on a passport. Where's their entire family going to come? Or are they going to have to choose between those, those parties in their household? Like. I know that's a little foreign to, to America, but this is some of the decisions that were being made. And this is what was being said of like, if you want to come, well, how are you gonna make that choice? Like, how are you gonna, I, I can't fathom being in the uncomfortable position of having to say, hi, sorry, little bro, um, gotta bounce, or accepting the risk of living under Taliban rule. The uh, president had said there was no other way this could have been done. There was no more planning that could have been that it could have gone into this. There was no more preparation that could have gone into this. This was one of the things that he was discussing during his address to the nation, which I find from from what I can tell from your expression and everyone else that I've talked to, that's not what's the truth on that. That sounds not true. I, <laughs> so in the in the military, you plan for the best case, you plan for the most likely case, and you plan for the worst case. Mm. The, the pictures that you're showing right now and the amount of American weapons that they're holding, <laughs> can you please explain to me how that isn't the worst case and how that was part of the plan? I, I, like, yeah. it's, it's just absurd to me that, that they're even gonna say, that they're even gonna try and pretend to say that. Again, he thought it went extraordinarily well, you know? Like, and one of the other sound bites that he had was that there was quote, unanimous consensus from the senior leaders and the joint chiefs of staff to hold to our airlift schedule. The, the question the, the question that I wanna know, Dana, is who created the airlift schedule on, on the first place and why was it implemented the way that it was? Because I cannot, there's no way they planned for the, for the worst case. And being around a lot of people that worked in NGOs uh, for the past two weeks, people that, you know, reporters, who have who have been on the ground there, fellow veterans, you know, some in, you know former intel people, some former State Department people have all gone to the private sector. I find it so fascinating that every person in those groups have little bits and pieces, little snapshots of how the worst case could have happened. And if I can hear those through that, and those people exist and they're able to speak, you know, or the senior people in all those organizations are able to speak the administration, which they do, I don't know how they didn't put that together or at least consider it. Right? Yeah. I, it, there's no, there was no planning for the worst case scenario here. Oh, the 20 year war, your book. Mm -hmm. um, and that really, I mean that, I feel like there's gonna be a movie that's gonna be made about this experience and the, or the, this 20 year war, because you have, mm -hmm. I mean, my oldest son was six months old 
when on 9-11 and 20 right. years later, I mean, it's you've, you've had an entire generation of kids right. that have grown up. And as I've said earlier, they grew up in peace and not knowing terror alert levels because yeah. of the sacrifice of people who did their mission, the boots that did their job in Afghanistan. Tell me a little bit about your book. So the book is highlighting 71 individual veteran stories, starting from uh, Sergeant Major of the Army Tilly Wright, who was at the Pentagon on 9-11, all the way through uh, December of 2020, or is, is the length of time that these these stories go through. Uh, it's, a, it's a huge, as you can see behind me, it's a huge portrait book. It's 12 inches by 12 inches. And the first thing you do is a gorgeous portrait of who these veterans are. The, st the Their stories are what inspired them to serve this great nation, a brief sketch of their service, what their transition to civilian life was like, and then finally what they're doing now to continue to serve this country and to continue to make it the greatest place in the world. Uh, just because, you know, I, I mentioned him earlier, but Tim Kennedy's in it and he talks uh, very mm -hmm. frankly about uh, his evolution as a human being and how the military was good for that. Um, we have entrepreneurs in the book. We have uh, high level, you know, business people uh, in the private sector. We have, you know, people that are continuing to serve in the government. It is a wonderful snapshot of what, you know, inspires people to serve and how they uh, chose to go on to make America the greatest place in the world.